Praise God. I'm so glad to be here for this weekend. We've had such a tremendous time. Uh, and last night we were at the trampoline park and I was up on top of this wall trying to jump down on this trampoline and the idea is you're supposed to jump on it and pop back up. Well, I jumped off, but I didn't come back up. <laughs> I jumped on the trampoline and just crumbled there on the, on, the, on the trampoline. And, well, it felt like someone punched me in the stomach. But we have had such a great, tremendous time here with the youth. And uh, Miranda and the youth team have done such a phenomenal job. We were telling them last night that yesterday, in general, with the breakout rooms and uh, the trampoline park and everything just in general was such a blast. And we are so honored to be here. Today, I wonder if we could stand one more time for the reading of the Word of the Lord. If you could turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8. It says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. How many of you are thankful for the church today? How many of you are thankful for a place where you can come in and the presence of God can move just like it has already? Praise God. I'm thankful for the Spirit of God. And when I come in here this morning and I lift up my hands, I know that God is going to move. I know that God is going to have his way. It doesn't matter who you are, what walk of life you might be from. It doesn't matter what baggage you might bring through the door. But when we come into church and lift up our hands, God says, here's where I can meet you. God says, here is where I can change your life. Praise God. I'd like to speak to you this morning on the subject, a place of refuge. A place of refuge. If you could put down your Bibles and just once more lift up your hands and just enter into the presence of God this morning. Jesus, God, we love you this morning. God, we're so thankful for your word and for your spirit and for your touch that's already been here in this morning's service. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, God, that this morning you would give us a reverence, Lord Jesus, of the church, Lord God, that you would help us to realize the importance of this sanctuary sanctuary of God, Lord Jesus, the importance of the church, God. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd begin to speak to the hearts and the lives of the people in this building right now, Lord God, and that you would simply have your way this morning, Lord God, in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said amen. amen. Praise God. You may be seated this morning. When I grew up, I grew up in a typical pastor's home. I, I grew up sleeping under pews and eating the gum off of the bottom as a snack during church. Every time that the church doors were open, we were there. I, I could close my eyes and tell you everything about every detail of the church that I grew up in. So many times running through the sanctuary and, and hiding little notes and, and secret codes in the, in the different places, uh, up behind the, behind the pews or even in the pulpit. I'm sure there's probably still some of them there today. I was one of those kids, as I said on Friday night, that was a pretty big brat. I would go into the Sunday school classroom and me and my friend would, would get in there before the teacher got downstairs and, and she had all of her notes laid out on the table and she had a, a CD player there for playing a song later on during the lesson and, and we decided, well, well, let's hide everything. <laughs> Sister Sherry, if you're watching, I apologize for how much of a brat I was growing up. I wasn't much... Uh, better when I got into youth class. My, my youth pastor is here today, Brother Paul Thornton, and I remember going out to different things, and, and uh, on one particular occasion, we were out from the church on an outing, out from the church on an outing, and we, we were out, and, and uh, he looked at me as I was being my regular self, a pest, 
and said, Brayden, if you don't smarten up, I'm going to call your father. <laughs> and I said, good, I'd like to talk to him. <laughs> Young people don't do as I did. Me and my friend, we, we would do whatever we could, and, and, and we'd be loud in church and, and things like that, distracting people from my father while he was up there speaking. And my mother, to quiet us down, would literally drag us down the center aisle of the church. How ironic that her trying to quiet us down literally made every single person in the sanctuary look as this kid is being dragged down the center aisle back to dad's office saying, I don't want to go to dad's office. Because we knew that dad's office was not a happy place. I became accustomed to the things of the church. It was all that I ever really knew, and I'm thankful for that tonight. And those of you that have grown up in the church should be thankful for the life that you've lived being brought up in a place such as this. To us, sometimes it may just become a building with four walls and a roof, but it's so much more than that. We might get out of bed sometimes and not really feel like coming, but this is a place that we can come and be refreshed, where we can come and be renewed. This is a place where we can come and be loved unconditionally by God. This is the place where we can come and be moved upon by the Word and the presence of God. This is a place where we can come and the pastor says, God needs to move inside of your life. This is a place where we can come and receive direction and and spiritual leadership in life. It's the church. And we need to be thankful for the church. We might come in here so worn out and weary from a week of work or school and heartache or pain or being immersed in the culture around us. But when we come into the presence of God, we can leave all of that baggage at the door and just lift up our hands and allow the presence of God to just begin to move on our lives. I love when God takes over. I love when when the Spirit of God moves just like it did this morning and something begins to change because we're not so set in our ways that we have to stick so, so hard to a schedule. We just want God to move in here. That's the whole point of the church, uh, isn't just to have things uh, happen in an orderly fashion, but it's simply to get the heart uh, and the will of God in the lives of the people sitting in these pews. Uh, And if God wants to take over, and if God wants to move, uh, that's okay, uh, because that's what we want. Praise God. And I was punished in church for acting out. As me and my friend would play tag, then we'd always get that there would be no running in the house of God. But it wasn't because my parents were just trying to be mean or because they were simply annoyed of how bratty of a child I was, even though that was probably part of it. But it was because my mother and father wanted to plant something inside of me that the house of God was a place to be respected. It was a place to be regarded with high esteem because it isn't just some ordinary building, but it's a hospital for the, hoder- for the hurting and the broken. It's a sanctuary for those in need. It's a place where sinners can come and receive God into their lives. It's a place where no matter what you might have gone through, you can come and you can lift your hands and say, God, I'm sorry. And he says, I'm ready to meet you right where you're at. We need to have a reverence for the church. The church is not something that's just going to die out anytime soon. Matthew 16 and 18 says, And I also say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That means it doesn't matter what our culture might tell us. It doesn't matter who might come up to you and say, well, church, uh, that's just a thing of the past. Uh, It doesn't matter what they say over that pulpit. You don't need to listen to it. 
That means that whenever people come up to you and tell you that the Bible is nothing but a book of history and most of it is wrong, at that you can say, you know, I've got good authority right here in the book of God that says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That these young people can grab a hold of something and take the church to a new generation and say it doesn't matter what the culture says. It doesn't matter what society says. This church will never die. Society would have us believe that it's something of the past, but we know it not as something of the past, but as the hope for the future. All throughout history, God has raised up a church that no matter what the devil might try to do to destroy it, it will not fall. Throughout the Old Testament, he was establishing the church. He always had a certain people that would follow him. Even in the time of Noah, it may have only been one family, but it was the church. Throughout the years, we see that different people will take up the mantle to follow God and follow his will at all costs. Abraham would be the father of a great nation known as God's people. And down to Jacob, a man that fought with the angel and would not let go until he got what he wanted. Israel would then become the nation known as the children of God. And those 12 tribes may have gone through a lot, but they were delivered out of the captivity of Egypt under the leadership of Moses uh, and then Joshua and would establish themselves uh, as a nation. All throughout the Bible, if you look at it, God says, I will have a people that will follow me. And it's not something that's just going to pass away, uh, but it's something that the young people need to get a hold of uh, and say, I want to be part uh, of that generation. Uh, I want to be part uh, of that group uh, and the children of God. In the Old Testament, the promised land, was a place that Israel received years and years after they were freed from captivity. They they were distributed among the 12 tribes. The land was given to each and every one of the 12 tribes except for one. One tribe, however, was not given any land. But they were to be the priests of God and the overseers of the tabernacle. They were the only ones who could carry the tabernacle and and set it up as Israel moved throughout the wilderness. They had a special anointing of God on their lives that the other tribes didn't have. And when the land was distributed to all the rest of the tribes of Israel, they never got any. Numbers chapter 35 verse 1 to 3 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses in the plains of Moab, by Jordan near Jericho, saying, Command the children of Israel that they give unto the Levites of the inheritance of their possessions, cities to dwell in. And ye shall give also unto the Levites suburbs for the cities round about them, and the cities shall they dwell in, and the suburbs of them shall be for their cattle and their goods and for all their beasts. When it says, Command the children of Israel, that they give the Levites their inheritance of their possession cities to dwell in. It means that they didn't have a specific area that was given to them as their own. It means that they didn't really have their own land. They didn't have as much uh, place uh, of land as, as everyone else in Israel. Because their inheritance might not have been the land. The Bible says that their inheritance was the Lord's. Numbers 18 and 20 says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance in the land, neither shalt thou have any part among them. I am thy part and thine inheritance among the children of Israel. Aaron, you can look all around you at all of the other tribes of Israel. And you may look at them and see about their land and the place that they have and how nice it is. But Aaron, none of that matters because your inheritance is me. You can look around you at everything that society may have or may accumulate in their lifetime. But none of that really matters because your inheritance 
will be the Lord. We can search near and far and try to have the biggest house or the nicest car or the, be the most popular person. But none of that matters because your inheritance, ladies and gentlemen, in the house of God will be the Lord's. You may not get many possessions on earth here today, uh, but that's not something we need to focus uh, or dwell on because uh, we're not living for this world, uh, but we're living for the next one. Uh, We're not living just here to get material things, uh, but to get our inheritance uh, of God. Our job as a body of Christ is not to compare ourselves to the world and say, I wish I had this or I wish I had that because our inheritance is much more than that. The Bible says that heaven and earth shall pass away, but the things that you receive after this life in living in church and for the house of God will be the Lord. Numbers 35 verse 6 to 7 says, And among the cities which she shall give unto the Levites, there shall be six cities for refuge, which she shall appoint for the manslayer. The manslayer. That's a strange name. The manslayer. I just feel like it deserves like a different tone than than every other word in this verse. (laughs) That ye shall appoint for the manslayer. And he may flee thither, and, and to them ye shall add forty and two cities. So all the cities which ye shall give to the Levites shall be forty and eight cities. Them shall ye give with their suburbs. The Levites were not given land like the others, but they were split up between forty-eight different cities. And six out of these cities were to be cities that were designated as a place of refuge, a place of refuge. Joshua chapter 20 and verse 9 says, These were the cities appointed for all the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourneth among them, that whosoever killeth any person at unawares might flee thither and not die by the hand of the avenger of blood until he stood before the congregation. In the Old Testament, it was a law that if you, if you took someone's life, you were to be put to death. Even if it might have been unintentional, someone that knew the person or, or might have been related to the person that was killed could avenge their death and come after you. Unless you could get to a city of refuge. You could flee to one of these six cities and be safe from the avenger of the person's death until a trial was able to take place. And once a trial took place and the death was found unintentional, he could stay in the city of refuge and be safe until the current high priest had died. And after that, he could return to his own property. But if he left before the high priest had died, he could be killed by the avenger. I want you to understand this concept. That even though they may have done wrong, they could go to a place of refuge where the consequences of their sin were no longer held against them. The cities of refuge were places that people could go and it didn't matter whether they meant to or not before the trial, but they could stay there And the penalty of their sin was not held against them. They could stay there as long as the high priest was alive. Those cities of refuge, I believe, are a representation of the church. Where people can come and they can give their lives to God. It's a place where the consequences of your sin are no longer held against you. That when you walk through those back doors and when you lift up your hands and you say, God, I'm sorry for everything I've done. It doesn't matter what it is. But when you do that, God says the consequences of your sin will no longer be held against you. It is a place of refuge. 
The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 and 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our position. Jesus is our high priest, and he might have died, but he was resurrected, and he's never going to die again. That means that when you come into the house of God, and when you lift up your hands and say, God, I'm sorry for everything I've done, and you become baptized into the waters of baptism in the name of Jesus and you're filled with the Holy Ghost God says your sins are washed clean We know that our high priest will never die We know that our high priest will never leave us And so when we come into the presence of God He can say the consequences of your sin are left at the door the consequences of your sin will no longer be held against you. Romans 6 and 20, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through everything that we've done, we deserved to die. But because Jesus Christ came to earth, and pay the ultimate penalty, it means that we don't have to. In the Old Testament, the tabernacle was where the Shekinah glory of God would come down and rest on the mercy seat of God. It was a place of sacrifice and a place of praise. The tabernacle is the Old Testament equivalent to the church. Exodus 25 and 8, which I read in the beginning, says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God didn't want to just be something that was taken from place to place to place. But he said, I need something permanent in your life. I don't want to be just something that you pick and choose when you feel like it. I don't want to be just something that you come to when times get tough. I don't want to be just something that you come to when you feel like everything's okay and it's all right to step through those doors. But every single week, I want you to come into the house and the presence of God. I don't want to be just something temporary that you choose whenever you want me. I want to be permanent in your life. He said, I want to dwell among the people. And that word tabernacle literally means to dwell. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 2 to 6, it says that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go to all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go tell my servant David, thus, thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house to dwell in, whereas I have not dwelled in any house since the time I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in the tent and in a tabernacle. He said, I'm not satisfied with just being a temporary thing. I'm not satisfied with just being a Sunday morning person. I'm not satisfied with just being someone that you go to on the weekend, on Sunday, twice a day, and on Wednesday. I'm not satisfied with just being something that you go to when you feel like you really need me. I want to be something that is permanent and established in your life through everyone, all throughout Israel. I want to be something that is permanent in their lives. I'm tired of just being something that's temporary. David made it a priority to build the house of the Lord. David was called a man after God's own heart. And in his life, he treated the house of God with such respect. He put everything he could into building it. He said, this needs to be a priority in my nation. In the children of God. This needs to be a priority in my life. 
It's not something we can just kind of leave out of our lives. But he said, I need to have respect for the house of God. There needs to be a reverence uh, for the house of God. There needs to be an importance uh, in the house of God. There needs to be something in the house of God that we get a hold of uh, and we can't let go. I don't care what time it might be, but as long as those church doors are open, I want to be there. It might mean giving up some things uh, to be there, but I need to be there. It might mean letting go of some things so I can be in the house of God, but if I need to, I'll let them go. It might mean stopping to do some things that, that I've been doing, but I'm willing to do it because I need the house of God in my life. It might mean letting go of some sports or, or things that I've been bound up in. It might mean changing some shifts at work or, if necessary, giving up my job. But I can't let things get more important in my life than the house of God. The church is important. It took six days for God to speak the world into existence. Six days for him to spe speak and put the stars in the sky. Six days for him to think uh, about the molecular structure of our bodies and the plants and, and all the living organisms on earth. Six days for him to speak it all into existence. But it took him 40 days to speak the plans to Moses about the tabernacle because he said it's important to me every detail has to be thought out everything has to be looked after it's not something that's just an afterthought 40 days to tell Moses the plans for the tabernacle what took a little less than one chapter for all of creation to be spoken into existence it took six chapters in the Bible to describe the tabernacle of God because he said this is something that's important to me. This isn't something that I want you to, to allow yourself to just push into the background. This isn't something that I want you to allow yourself uh, to just think that it's temporary in your life. Uh, this isn't something that I want you to think that you can just pick and choose uh, about the services that you might attend uh, from time to time. This is something that you need in your life. If the music could come back this morning. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 20 to 22, it says, And Noah began to, to be a, a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, he saw the nakedness of his father and told his brethren without. Noah, the family that was really the only people left the church and the Bible says that Noah got into something that he shouldn't have and his own son walks in and sees him in his sinful state and comes out to his brothers and says look at dad in there he looks hilarious he tells his brothers about his father's sin while he could have just gone in and, and said, Dad, let me help you. Instead, he chose to go out to his brothers and say, Dad's in there. Dad messed up. Let me tell you about it. But the Bible says in verse 23 to 25, And Shem and Japheth took a garment. And they laid it upon both of their shoulders and went in backward. And the Bible says, and they covered the nakedness of their father. 
and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. So they take a garment, and they just walk into the tent. They don't say a word, and they just cover him up. The Bible says, and Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him and said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. The devil might try so hard to put condemnation on people's lives. I believe that one of the biggest reasons why we don't see backsliders walking through those doors is because they think to themselves, what are people going to think of me? How are people going to treat me? What are people going to say behind my back? While Ham came out of the tent and said, Dad's in there. Dad sinned. Well, he wasn't concerned with anything else but telling other people about his fallen father's sin. It took his two other brothers to say, it doesn't matter what dad did. He's part of the church, and we've got to cover it up. They said, we don't need to talk about it. We don't need to bring it up. We've just got to cover him. Because that's what he needs right now. The church doesn't need people talking about people's wrongdoings or people's sins. But we need people that when backsliders walk through that back door, or when sinners might walk through that back door, we need people that are going to say, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've gone through. Because we can cover it up. I know the master that can forgive every sin. We don't need to talk about it. We don't need to bring it up. But I know the place that you need to be. We need people that are going to walk. Walk up to people that might have done wrong. And come up to them and just say, God can forgive that. God can touch that. This is a place of refuge. This is a place of sanctuary. This is a place where you can come and be forgiven. This is a place where you can come and be renewed. This is a place where you can come and be refreshed. You don't have to worry about people talking about you. You don't have to worry about what people think of you because we're just worried about covering you up. We just need to cover you up. I wonder if we could all stand this morning. In the book of Luke, Jesus tells a parable about the prodigal son. The prodigal son, he wanted all of these different things. And so he goes out with his father's inheritance and spends it all on anything he can, trying to fit in, trying to be something that he's not. And he finds himself in a pigsty. How disgusting. Has anyone ever smelled pigs? My grandparents are, are from Norton, and, and you can smell pigs from like miles away. While the son was laying there in a pigsty, he probably smelled bad. He probably looked bad. Pigs aren't necessarily the cleanest of creatures. He might have had dirt and mud all over him. And he tells himself, if I can go back to dad, he treats his servants better than I'm being treated right now. And I love what happens in Luke chapter 15, verse 20 to 24. The Bible says, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. 
And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight I am no more worthy to be called thy son. And listen to what the father says. He doesn't respond. He doesn't bring up his son's sins. The Bible says in verse 22, But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and his life again. He was lost and is found, and, and they began to be married. What's your name? Do you mind if you come help me? I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm talking to you. Do you mind if you come help me? You're going to be the prodigal son, okay? You don't stink. You don't look bad. You look good. I like the bow tie. Looks great. But you're going to be the prodigal son, okay? Just imagine yourself covered in dirt. You're covered in mud. You stink. Brother Carter doesn't want to be around you. <laughs> but you come home, and, and after you've been away for a long time, you look bad, you smell bad. But the father doesn't acknowledge that. He simply says, let's cover him up. That's a good look for you. He says, let's cover him up. All the dirt that's on his clothes, uh, uh, everything that might be showing about where he was is now covered up. He said, I'm not concerned about where you've been. What's your name? Lucas. You've got dirt all over you, but we'll cover it up with the best robe we possibly can. Because when you come back to the Father's house, uh, Lucas, that's not going to be held against you. That's not going to be something that everyone looks at and everyone sees. Before he ever brought him back to his own house and fed him, he said, let's cover you up first. Because a place of refuge is a place where the consequences of your sin are no longer held against you. When you walk through those back doors, it's not a place. Thank you, Lucas. You can go sit down. When you walk through those back doors, it's not a place where people are going to talk about you and say, look where they've been and look where they've done. Young people, let me tell you something. God forbid should you ever mess up or slip up. But if you ever do, just know that these doors represent a place of refuge that you can come back into. And nobody's going to talk about it. Nobody's going to bring it up. Everyone's just going to say, let's cover you up. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you look like. God can forgive you. I wonder if we could worship the Lord right now. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Just for a few more moments, church, I wonder if we can lift up the name of the Lord. God, we need you, Lord. God, we need the place of refuge. God, we need your covering. God, we need your forgiveness. God, I know I might have done wrong, but I know if I can get back into the house of God. God, I know I might have messed up, but if I can just get through the doors of that place of refuge, God, I know I might have done something against your will, uh, but if I can just step through the doors of the church. Hallelujah, Jesus. I'm going to open up these altars this morning. I wonder if we could just come around.
It doesn't matter what people think. It doesn't matter what people might say. I want you to make up in your mind, I, I need the altar. I need the house of God. I need the church. I need the covering. I need a place of refuge. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I feel God in here this morning, church. I feel like God wants to speak to someone about raising the bar, about breaking out of the rut that you've been stuck in, about breaking out of the place and the path that you've been following. I've got to put the church first. I've got to put the church first. I've got to put the place of refuge as a priority in life. I need the covering. Hallelujah, Jesus.